Take your Bible and go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Last week when we opened this particular chapter, I said really uh, verses 1 and 2 go together, but we chose to to separate them out and, and look at the idea of strengthening grace last week about what does it mean to, to be strengthened by grace. This week we come to this verse, which is probably one of the most familiar verses of, of Paul's pastoral epistles. Uh, I, I, I've seen this verse used in a number of different contexts, um, usually in the area of discipleship, the idea of multiplication principles. Christian organizations use this, um, this passage to, to illustrate a principle that they're trying to, to live by, work by. I, uh, th- this past uh, a week or so ago, we were involved in a training session with pastors in Kenya doing what 2 Timothy 2.2 2, uh, speaks of. And, and so it, it becomes a very important verse uh, for us to understand and how then we apply this uh, in the life of the household of God and even for uh, our own personal households. Okay, So... Very familiar. I, I'll read verse 1 to go along with it. Uh, verse 1 and then verse 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Very simple. Verse 2. What you've heard from me, and trust the faithful men who therefore can teach others also. There's a multiplication principle. There's a reproduction principle uh, that, that's involved here. Uh, but remember that what, what Timothy is receiving this letter uh, from Paul, Paul is going to die. Uh, Paul is in prison. Paul's going to die. And so for Paul, there's a great concern for how does this truth of the message, we'll talk about the truth of the gospel, how how do we ensure that, that it goes beyond from one generation to another generation? And that really is what we're talking about, is a letter to the next generation. And how, do we, how do we pass this along, this faith? Let, let me just make one observation as, as we start. That Paul is not arguing for apostolic succession. Okay? He can't use... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, to say, you know, it was apostles appointing apostles, appointing apostles, appointing apostles. That, that's not what he's doing. Okay? There, there, there's no apostolic succession. There's not the idea of that authority. It's not Peter to, to the next bishop of Rome, to the next bishop of Rome, to the next. That's not what he's advocating. There's a principle that he's giving us for the preservation of the truth of God as it goes from generation to generation so that it would get from the time of the early church to what we're doing today. That's what Paul is instructing Timothy uh, regarding passing this on, passing the baton of truth on. Okay? So, as he... We use a, maybe a, a relay race as an illustration. I, that seems to be a, a good illustration. Uh, I don't know if you've ever run in a relay race, uh, the idea of holding a baton and, and then getting whether it's a, the 4 by 100 relay, you know, you run the 100 meters, pass it off, or the 4 by 400 meter relay, whatever. The idea is that you have a baton that you're passing on to the next person. Well, the first thing you need to think about is, uh, do I have the right baton? Okay. Uh, when, when we used to do this, we used to have a, a sports day. Um, growing up in Bermuda and the education system I've shared with you is very different. And, and so the secondary school was divided into houses. Okay, so you, you were in one of four houses. Every student was in a house. Uh, I I was in Butterfield House. The other houses were Watlington House, Darrell House, and Salta's House. 
So every student was a member of a house. And for sports activities, what we might call intramural, houses competed against houses. So, so when it came to, to that track day competition, a Butterfield house had a baton that had a green band on it because Butterfield House was green, Salter's House was red, Watlington House was yellow, Darrell House was blue. So the first thing you did when you were in that relay race is look at your baton to make sure you had the right one because you didn't want to be passing on the wrong color baton. So the first thing that, that we want to make note of is what Paul gives to Timothy is that you make sure you have the right baton. Paul says, that which you heard from me. What he's referring to is what he's talked about a little bit earlier. When he says back in, in verse 13, follow the pattern of the sound words which you heard from me. Sound words, the teachings, we might call it doctrine. Uh, a little earlier, he's talked about the gospel. We spent some time looking at the idea of the gospel that he talks about back in verse 8, verse 9. Well, what, what are the, the truths that Paul would have been saying, look, hang on to these Make sure that you've got them right on these. Well, the first would be a very obvious, and that is that, that there's one true God who's revealed himself. Now, that may sound rather obvious to us, but, but think about the context in which Paul was living. He, he, he was going into cities, Greek, Roman cities, where there were multiple gods. Remember Acts chapter 17? He's walking through Athens, and he sees statue after statue after statue. And he says, look, I perceive that you're a religious people. <laughs> you got lots of gods, but I want to hear, I want to tell you about this one. So, so the first thing that you hold on to is who the one true God is and that he's revealed himself so we can know him. And he's revealed himself in a variety of ways. He's revealed himself in, in nature. He's revealed himself in scripture. But Paul would say to Timothy, make sure you understand who this God is. And, you know, that, that may be fleshed out a little bit. We, we sang about how it might be fleshed out. Okay? Come thou almighty king, come thou incarnate word, come Holy Spirit, see? We, we, the triunity of God. That, that's part of this, what you hold to be true. And then second would be that Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God. He, he's the son of David according to the flesh, but he's the son of God, Paul says in Romans 1. He's the son of God, and that's been demonstrated by power of the resurrection from the dead. That he is the one that God has designated. Certainly, that, that the idea of the son of God would speak to the deity of Christ, who he is but it also speaks to his rule, which is elaborated on a little bit later. Uh, Jesus is the Christ. Again, understand the context into which Paul was preaching. Uh, not only a Greek or a Roman context, Paul would go into the synagogues first. Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul, before he goes to Athens, he's in Thessalonica, and, and Luke makes this observation. He said, look, as was his custom, Paul would go into the synagogues and reason with them from the scriptures, proving from them, dialoguing with them, how it was necessary for the Christ, the Messiah, to suffer and to die, to be raised again, and that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. That's what John says. When John writes his gospel, he said, I have written these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing, you have life in his name. 
Jesus is the Messiah. He's the anointed one, the one who fulfills all those promises of the Messiah in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. And then certainly, even as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which is of first importance, how that Christ died for our sins. The substitutionary death of Christ. That he was buried. And that on the third day he rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures. The resurrection. Holding to the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. And then the exaltation. The ascension. That this is the one who has ascended into heaven and seated, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And Paul would say in Philippians chapter 2 that he's been exalted and given a name that's above every name. That the name of Jesus every knee bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord. He is the Lord, not Caesar. And that certainly Jesus is going to return. Those form the essential truths that Paul had been teaching, preaching throughout his ministry. If you, you work your way through the book of Acts, you work your way through Paul's letters, and it becomes very apparent that these form the basis of Paul's sound words, the sound teaching. This is what he's told Timothy, to guard. To guard the good deposit, that which had been taught, the truth of God. That, that's content. Having the right baton is having the right content. And what Paul says is that it's authenticated by witnesses and corroborated by lifestyle. He says, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Now why does Paul add that? It's to, corrupt, to authenticate the message that he's preaching. Remember that, that a, a faithful witness, a case is only heard on the basis of two or three witnesses. There, there are many witnesses who would testify that this is the message that Paul preached. And this is, this is the message that Paul preached. They would say this is the apostolic message. This is the message of truth. So Timothy, go check it out. Am I teaching anything counter to what has been taught even by others? And then corroborated by lifestyle. When he says what you've heard from me, I, I, I like what he says in Philippians chapter 4. He elaborates on that a, just a little bit. In Philippians chapter 4, he, he says in verse 9, what you've learned, received, heard, and seen in me. Hmm. Practice these things. Not only what you've heard, but what you observe, what you've seen. And that really does tell us an important principle for, for this idea of passing on from one generation to another. You can have the right content, but it needs to be matched by lifestyle. And so there's a term, orthodoxy, that's right thinking, Right belief, what we hold to be the truth, should always lead to orthopraxy. That is how it's lived out. Christian truth leads to a Christian life. So what Paul is saying to Timothy is if you're going to be passing on the baton, Look at me. In fact, there are many occasions where Paul says, be imitators of me, even as I am of Christ, he says. Paul would say, if you're going to pass on the baton, make sure you have the truth right, the content right, 
but you want to make sure that it matches what you see, how that impacts your life. There ought to be some consistency of how that truth is translated into everyday living as a Christian. It's one of the great difficulties of our world is many times when you go to share your faith is people will say, well, I, I know Christians who or Christianity has done this. And, and many times I have to admit that yes, institutional Christianity is guilty of some horrendous things. Institutional Christianity has been guilty of anti-Semitism. Institutional Christianity has been guilty of racism. Institutional Christianity has been guilty of waging war. Uh, institutional Christianity. The problem is that's institutional Christianity. Where, where the truth, the truth has it matched up to the lifestyle. Well, Paul is arguing. He says, Timothy, if you're going to pass on from one generation to another, make sure that those two are hand in hand. Okay. Not only what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, but also what you've seen in me. But then you've got to hand off to the right recipient. So it, it, going back to my field days, I, track and field days, you, you would take that baton. I had the green one. I just needed to make sure that the person I handed it to was wearing a green jersey. I didn't want to hand it to somebody wearing a blue jersey. You know, one of the interesting things, if you, you could think back to the Olympics re in recent history, the United States hasn't fared very well in the 4x100 relay. You know why? They keep dropping the exchanges. They can't get the exchange right. Either dropping it or passing it beyond the limit. Or, but there's always something. And so there is a danger, there is a danger in passing the baton, but at least get this part right, that you are passing it off to the right person. The right recipient, Paul identifies by two qualifications. Very simple, faithful and competent. That's it, faithful and competent. Right character, and competence. Well, one of the things that as we think about succession, that this is Paul's, by the way, this is Paul's plan of succession. Okay? Make sure the person has the right doctrine. Make sure the person has the right character. Make sure the person has the right competence. The character is faithfulness. The competence is able to communicate to others. If I ever come up with qualifications, I might come up with a few more, but I'm not Paul. And so I, I, I began to ask myself, what is it? Especially to faithful. Now, let me just say this right off, off bat. The English translations say faithful men, okay? Don't think that this is limited to men, okay? The, the word that Paul uses here is the more generic word, okay? It's the word anthropos, but anthropos speaks of mankind, people in general. So there, there are sometimes it could refer to the male, other times it could just refer to them, just people, okay? Uh, there, there are texts where Paul is much more gender specific. This isn't one of them. So let me just quickly just say, look, don't look at word men and say, oh, that's just for men. No, this is for women too, okay? This is for women too. Faithfulness, faithfulness, that character trait. 
And I asked myself, what does it mean to be faithful? What does that mean? What, what, are, the, what are the characteristics uh, of somebody marked by faithfulness? Um, I, I have five for you, very simple. Maybe you could add more. I, I think in this context, because what Paul is talking about is the household of God, first off. Okay? The household of God. Paul talks about the household of God, and then he talks about personal households. I think he's referring here primarily to the household of God. And so this first one holds to the truth. A faithful person is one who says, I hold to those things, the content of the faith. It would only make sense for what Paul is saying in this context that this person at least has to be a believer, has to believe the gospel. That they have to be one who, who says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. I, I believe in, in his death and resurrection. So a, a faithful person that you're going to pass this baton on in the household of God at least has to hold to the same truths that you claim to be authoritative truth. I'm so glad you, Faith Bible Church has nothing to fear about pastoral succession in the elders of this church bringing in somebody who doesn't hold to the essentials of the faith. That will not happen. You hold to the truth. Secondly, they have to have a humble spirit. Faithfulness, I think, is a humble spirit. First Corinthians chapter four. First Corinthians chapter four. I, Paul, in his letters to the Corinthians, many times talks about his own personal ministry and is defending that ministry and his apostleship. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the truths that God has revealed. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. And I put the idea of humility in this context, and that is they're stewards. A steward knows who they are, and that means they're not the master. That they are servants who give an account for how well they, they manage what's been entrusted to them. To be a steward, to be a servant, to be a servant is somebody who recognizes who they are in light of who the king is and who the master is. In the life of the church, it's somebody who recognizes I want you to find people who hold to the truth, who have a humble spirit, who recognize they are stewards entrusted with something that they'll give an account to. Uh, thirdly, honest. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about Again, his ministry in comparison to others. And he says, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. We've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. And we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word 
but the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. They are honest. They handle God's word honestly. They live honest lives. They're not trying to do for their own personal gain. They're honest, trustworthy. They honor commitments. They honor commitments. Back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, remember the illustrations that he's given for Jealous and Hermogenes, who, who walked out, who left, in contrast to Anesophorus. They honor their commitments even when the circumstances change. I want to tell you, I, some of the stories of pastors in Ukraine coming out, pastors who have remained to shepherd the people that God has given them, honoring a commitment even when the circumstances have changed. They're faithful in keeping those commitments. Those commitments can range from spiritual vows to marriage vows to parenting vows. Commitments. And a heart for others over self. That, that certainly is an expression of humility. But one who is faithful looks at how they can be of assistance to others, that they're not coming with a personal agenda to use people. People, people aren't there for them to use for themselves, but honestly have a heart for the good of the others. Remember, we referenced Philippians, where after giving the great illustration of Jesus, Paul talks about Timothy, and he says, look, I don't have anyone like him who will seek out for your interests rather than his own. I think that's the kind of people, the faithful people, that Timothy was to look for to be able to entrust to them that which had been entrusted to him. Faithful people. The, one of the questions that, that we ought to be asking ourselves is <laughs> if Timothy were on the lookout for, for somebody to, to pass on the deposit to, would he look at me? Would I be on his list? Would I be, would I be a faithful person? I, I hope so. But you have to answer that. And then there has to be the right competence, who are able to teach others also. There's this generational idea. I'm, that which I've taught you, you give to somebody else who can teach somebody else. There's four generations here. Able to teach really speaks to adequacy. Uh, Paul uses the same word here. It's not the same word that you find in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the qualifications for an elder, it says apt to teach. It, Paul doesn't use that word here. Paul uses another word. He uses a word adequate to teach. It, it's a word that he, he uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 when he says, look, our sufficiency, our adequacy doesn't come from ourselves. Our adequacy comes from the Lord. Our sufficiency comes from the Lord. And I think what Paul is saying is that it's one who recognizes that their adequacy comes from God, and that means they're not necessarily the most gifted. They're not at all Apollos, who was extremely gifted at teaching, eloquent in his words, but one who is competent, 
at faithfully communicating God's truth to others so that it can be faithfully passed to the next generation. Find someone who's able to take what you give them, understand it, process it, and then able to communicate that to teach somebody else in such a way that they can teach it to the next generation. That they're adequate for that, they're competent for that. Those are the two qualifications that Paul says, Timothy, the succession plan, the, the passing the baton plan is, is not complicated. Take what I've given you and shown you and model for you. Find faithful people, particularly those who have that character and have some measure of competence to pass that on to the next generation. Uh, that, that's true in the life of the household of God. That, that, that really, both whether we're talking about what the church is currently doing in terms of the succession plan here, or, or, or what we try to do internally in leadership in the church. And again, we're, we're not, not everybody's going to be an elder or a deacon, but our goal is to, to entrust the truth to faithful people who, who can in turn teach others also, that, that wh wh whether you're a Sunday school teacher serving in whatever role, men, women, to help you be a faithful person, to take the truth of God and, and to pass that on. The women's ministry this principle. In formal leadership positions, this ministry. If you talk to Mark, that's what he's trying to do in student ministries. The household, your personal household, I think this principle remains true as well. Uh, the one the one area that is difficult, and we don't have time to explore it, would be the idea of, does my child have to be a believer? We, we see that, I, I dealt with that this week in counsel with another pastor who's struggling, whether he's qualified to be a pastor or not, because of decisions of adult children And there are things that are beyond our control, beyond our authority. But I, I would say, listen, you can't make your children believers, okay? You don't control that. You're not in charge of that. You be faithful in presenting the gospel to them. You be faithful in living out the reality of the gospel before them so that there is a harmony between what you say and what they see. But you can still help your children, hopefully, understand what the value of being honest, of honoring commitments. Of the necessity of humility, how they serve others. Those are traits you can and still pass on value in your household. Paul would say, in your own household, but more in the household of God. Pass the baton from generation to generation to generation. The content of the truth, the character, and the competence.